My name is Ahmed Chen. I uh, head up marketing and product management at SpiderCloud. I'd like to take 15, 20 minutes of your time, talk about, um, Hello. Uh, talk about virtualization and, uh, and small cells. So I think uh, all, of us, uh, all of us would agree that, that, that small cells are essential to building capacity in the network. I, I don't think anybody in the industry disagrees at this stage. In fact, if you look at the whole way we have, all of us have built cellular networks over the last now 40 years or more, it has been by having more cell sites. So I remember reading an article about AT&T doing some early trials of uh, mobile telephony in the 1970s, and they had one cell tower to cover New York City. And at that time, yes, it did work, but you had to get a really, you had to get a special device, you had to pay many dollars a minute to get onto that network. So, so the way over the, last, uh, over, over the last several decades, we have added capacity in our network and made it possible for all of us all of us to use, uh, use cellular telephony all the time is by having more cells in our, in our network. That is, that is basically what cellular is, is about. And I think the same concept goes as we are, as we are all looking ahead. Uh, we are looking at uh, LTE Advanced. We are looking at 5G. It's a question of how do we have, how do we have more cells in our, uh, in our network and add, and, add, and add capacity. So I think that is the key reason why, uh, why, why small cells uh, are uh, today being talked about by every operator in the industry. Uh, when, when you go to like 5G events right now, they'll talk about why small cells are critical to, uh, are critical to 5G. Um, now, one thing we all have to remember is that just having lots of cell sites, just like randomly throwing uh, small base stations around doesn't add capacity. Um, the, the cellular network is a, is, is a coordinated network. It's a synchronous network you have to make sure that all these small cells can work together. Uh, I think the example that uh, I believe Luigi had given in his previous presentation was what if you went to a stadium and filled it up with a whole bunch of femtocells? Well, that's a terrible idea. You'll have lots of femtocells and no service. So <laughs> the thing we have to think about is how do we have small cells as a way to add capacity? How do we coordinate these small cells and uh, how do we make these networks work? So the second, so that's one. The second topic that we are all talking about is virtualization. Uh, that's a big topic again in the industry. And the reason why people care about virtualization is, uh, at least in my book, there are three reasons. The first one is we are all looking for ways to reduce, for re to reduce cost. Um, all of us are using more and more data every day. Uh, but if, if, our, uh, if, our, if, our monthly, uh, if our monthly bills scaled at the, same at the same pace at which our data usage is increasing, I think soon we'll be giving all our income, everything we earn every month to the mobile operators. We are not doing that. We're still paying we're about over fifty to hundred dollars a month and much lower in many other parts of the world. So so operators have to figure out how do they deliver capacity at a much lower cost. So that is that is item number one. The second thing is you still have to do it while uh, delivering uh, while, while delivering high performance. I think uh, especially as we look ahead, the the thing that would separate the cellular operator, let's say, from somebody who has a collection of Wi-Fi access points. Is that, the, is that on the cellular network, they can manage the performance, they can monitor it, they can, they can actually provide good quality of service to their subscribers. So, so, so performance is a must-have in these networks. And then the third reason why carriers are looking at uh, virtualization right now is, is as they're looking at the evolution of their network. So it's not about just what are the boxes that we put in our network today, but how do we design a network that works for us today in the 4G space but uh, five years from now, that architecture still needs to be valid as we move towards 5G. And if you look at the requirements that ITU is putting for 5G, and is being discussed in standards bodies right now, a key requirement for 5G is to have low latency. Uh, I was at a talk yesterday in which people were talking about the tactile internet, about how someday uh, a surgeon sitting in, um, in, in New York or California would be able to perform a surgery in um, uh, using a robotic hand in, uh, in, in an hospital in Africa. Now, that's, that, that is future looking, but that's the kind of things that we want to accomplish uh, if we are looking ahead five, ten years from now. And that needs extremely low latency network if you, if you have to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. So latency is key. The other thing that's going to be key is using uh, lots of different kinds of spectrum. So this is something we have seen already when we moved from, say, 3G to 4G. If you remember in, in, in 3G, there were very few frequency bands on which the world's 3G network was built. So in the US, we had 
you know, the PCS band, 850 band, maybe then AWS. In Europe, all the 3G networks were built on the 2100 uh, megahertz band. Uh, today, when we are looking at LTE, there is like this massive proliferation of band classes. And uh, using LTE advanced, we are trying to put all these multiple bands together. But if you can now kind of look ahead at, um, uh, at in, in the future, you'll have even more band classes. As you try to deliver more and more capacity to people, you'll need to put more and more spectrum into play. And the spectrum won't just be licensed spectrum. It's also going to be unlicensed spectrum. And in the, in the case of unlicensed, uh, we'll have to find a way to coexist with uh, other uses of unlicensed that are out there. So I think all, that, all this has to be thought through as we are thinking about network evolution and how we are, how we are virtualizing. So at, at a very high level, um, virtualization, virtualization really comes down to, starts with the topic of how do we split the base station? I think that's the main question people uh, are asking. Uh, LTE recommended that you should have a, if you look at the original LTE standards, there was, there was the talk of the flat architecture where you'll have an LTE node bay. It would do everything from RF all the way um, you know, to, the, uh, to, to the RRC uh, layer, connect back to the EPC. So that was the kind of traditional uh, base station architecture. And now as, as we are all discussing cloud run and virtualization, the, the discussion is, well, how do we, it, it, does it make sense for us to look at different forms of split base station architectures. What is the, what is the functionality that, is, that would be better off running on a, on a virtualized platform? What would be functionality that makes sense on a, on a remote, uh, you know, on, on a remote uh, probably custom hardware platform? How do we get this split right? So that's, that's, that's the question that people are discussing in the industry. And there are, there are multiple approaches. Um, I, have, I, I won't... Uh, I, I, I have a point of view, but others have a point of view as well on that topic. But the main problem we are all trying to look at is how do we split the base station architecture so that we can meet the three objectives of reducing cost, improving performance, and making sure our networks can, can evolve. Now, the, the approach that I see most of the big base station vendors, the, uh, the Ericsson's, Nokia's, uh, I was going to say Alcatel Lucent, but I won't said Nokia. Uh, so Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, uh, and uh, the big base station vendors are promoting is the, is the so-called centralized baseband approach, uh, in which uh, you have the, you basically have their E node B, everything but the, but the RF, and that is hosted in some kind of a centralized data center. And then these E node Bs uh, are connected via the CIPRI interface uh, to radio heads that are connected at, that, that are located at cell sites. And the typical advantages that people will bring up of this architecture is that, well, this gives you a lot of flexibility in, in the way in which the base station can be used. So there might be a radio head that is located in a, you know, in a residential area. There's another radio head that is in a, you know, where people are at work. You can somehow load balance the capacity between uh, <laughs> these two different uses yes. uh, and share to share the base station. So that's the key benefit that, is, that people talk uh, about when they look at the, these centralized the base station architectures. Uh, now, one of the limitations out here, of course, is that this, this does, um, since I didn't it is the CIPRI interface that is being um, used between uh, the baseband me, but, yeah. and the RF, uh, yes, sir. this interface okay. requires a latency less than 250 <laughs> microseconds. I, I think the and the only way to get that kind of uh, 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 such a low latency on this link is that you have to use, uh, you have to use oh. fiber back. <laughs> so, so, so this does make the deployments quite expensive. Well, the second thing to also look at is that even, even, if the, even if it was 250 microseconds, with this architecture, could you actually well, meet the 5G involved, requirements? But, uh, could you actually go down to, um, to, like a, to like a millisecond? Both, uh, because, uh, because now you are separating the, the radios with the, the actual radio head from which the signal is being transmitted or received from uh, the location where so your baseband processing is being done. So, the so there is basically additional latency that is being introduced uh, in the network, even if you're using so uh, the, even the if other you're using the fiber as the, as the front end. Yeah. But, but this is definitely one approach, and uh, there are implementations uh, out there. Uh -huh. uh, another approach, actually, that, uh, uh, that Aspire Cloud we, we promote is the approach of actually having the baseband functionality at the edge. We believe that uh, the, the RF, the layer one, uh, the scheduler, 
these functions should be as close to the user as possible. Uh, so we call this having the functionality of having baseband at the edge. And then what should be what should be centralized and then running on virtualized platforms is the capability for coordinating the baseband. So uh, that's where your SON functionality would live. That's where uh, your uh, uh, radio resource control would live. This is where interference coordination would live. So the functionality to make all these the, the, the distributed baseband elements work together as a high performance uh, radio access radio access network. The, the key reason why we believe in having baseband at the edge is that, uh, is that, is that baseband runs on silicon. I think that's one of the, uh, as, as I look at the last you know, several decades of electronics, there, there is a difference in the cost curve of uh, digital technologies of, of silicon versus that of analog technologies. So, so when we look at chipsets that sit inside our um, uh, these these radio heads, uh, these chipsets are, are are will continue to fall in cost <laughs> and continue to deliver a lot more power. Uh, I recall when I used to work in the macro base station business, we used to spend like thousands of dollars and have this huge channel card which we would put inside a macro base station, and it would provide right. like five megabits per second of capacity. And yes, we would do like press releases kind of and demonstrations. Five megabits per second. The conservatism and really Today, when we have um, an, LTE, uh, an LTE it's small done. cell, uh, which has just a, a tiny system on chip, which costs in the tens of dollars, time. that chip can provide, uh, can provide 300 megabits per second. And that is only going to Absolutely. get better. And it has the processing power that you can easily yeah, run it, the scheduler. You can, on, on, that, on the same chip uh, that is built in, in tens of dollars, you can run the, the baseband, and, you can run the scheduler, you can run a whole bunch of upper layer software. So, and, and since, it, and since so this chip follows Moore's law, it's only wrong. going to get better. So the thing that people have to think about is, do you want to bet against Moore's law? Yeah. If you want to do it, you know, it's, it's Everybody has to make their own bets in their life, and you should do it. But I wouldn't. And, and that's why we strongly believe in having baseband at the edge and just, and just virtualizing the, the, the coordination functionality so uh, in the network. The other thing that we should, we, the other reason we also really believe in having baseband at the edge is, uh, is when we look ahead at, at unlicensed spectrum. So, So the biggest yeah. issue in unlicensed yeah. spectrum yeah. is the fact that you have to share the unlicensed spectrum. Now, this is a huge difference from the way we have been looking at LTE so far in the license band. Uh, because in the, in, in the license band, all you have to do is you know, schedule your packets, send them out. That's it. You don't have to worry about what else is happening on the channel. You're the, you're the operator. It's your own channel. Here, in the unlicensed band, now you have to work with a whole bunch of devices. You have to work with Wi-Fi. There right. is Bluetooth. There might be... You know, there could be a wide range of applications that show up in the future. And all these technologies have to, have to coexist with each other. So the way coexistence works is that you, have to, you need the ability to, to, first of all, assess if the channel is available. The moment you find out that the channel is available, you then need to reserve it, and then you need to transmit in it. So this is exactly what happens in Wi-Fi. So in a Wi-Fi system, uh, a Wi-Fi access point monitors the channel for 40 microseconds realizes that a, the channel is available, yeah. immediately makes a decision that it's going to transmit. It has around nine microseconds to reserve the channel, and then it has to use it. So, so from the time you decided to transmit to the time you're able to use the channel, you have less than 50 microseconds. Now imagine that uh, you had a radio head uh, out uh, on, a, on a cell site or on a, across a dark fiber link. By the time this, uh, this radio head as the radio head assesses that the channel is available, and it has to get this information all the way back to, to where the baseband is located. Uh, by the time it does it, and it finds out it, that it should use the channel, the channel is gone. There's, there's a Wi-Fi access point close by who has grabbed the channel, and it's gone. So you might have this wonderful LTE unlicensed system running on your, uh, on your base station, but you'll never be able to grab the channel. So, you know, what good, what good is it going to do to you? So that's why the, 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 the capability of uh, sensing the channel, reserving the channel, transmitting the channel, 
all that has to be at the same, has to be co-located. The only way you can get this kind of tight, um, uh, you can meet these kind of really, really tight latency requirements is if the LTE baseband as well as this uh, unlicensed spectrum sensing capability uh, is, is co-located at the, at the same location. And I think this is another reason why we're, at least in our opinion, the centralized baseband architectures are going to uh, uh, be at a disadvantage uh, moving forward. So uh, that's basically it from my side. I'll just end by saying that uh, uh, from a spider cloud approach, we are, um, uh, our, our, our vision is uh, a world in which you have uh, small cells uh, everywhere, whether it's in the largest uh, buildings, um, from the stadiums to the shopping malls to enterprises, to perhaps uh, homes, residences, small offices, to outdoor locations. Uh, these small cells have the baseband functionality, the layer one, uh, the, the, the MAC functionality, uh, running on these, on these extremely low cost, powerful SOCs. And, and this network of small cells is being uh, coordinated by virtualized RAN controllers. So that's, the, that's our vision, and uh, working hard to make it happen. I'll stop and take any questions. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, so the best, our, our solution uh, works over the Ethernet LAN. And uh, at least in my opinion, the Ethernet LAN is, the, is, in any building, is the true multi-carrier neutral host infrastructure. Uh, because that is the infrastructure on which you can run practically anything inside your building, whether it is uh, cellular uh, small cells, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's your PC, or your printer, right? So our, our view is that the, the enterprise or the building should build an Ethernet LAN inside, or if they have an existing Ethernet LAN, use it. And then at that point, they have the flexibility to use uh, small cells from, uh, or, or Wi-Fi access points from that matter from a wide range, of, wide range of people. There is no need to actually create a very complicated so-called multi-operator radio infrastructure and then wait for the macro, wait for the operator to then bring you uh, $50,000 base station to put inside a closet with a heating system. I think that's just a, uh, it's, it's, that's the way things were done. That doesn't mean that should be the way things should be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could use any version. You could use CAT5. Um, because in, when, when we have an architecture like this uh, in which Uh, see when you uh, when when you run both the when, when you run the layer one, uh, the, the file layer as well as the Mac layer functionality on the on the on the radio. After that, the only traffic that is going between your uh, radio and the 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 controller node is just user traffic. So if if you as a user are downloading like five megabits per second, that's exactly what you'll see on the Ethernet link, five megabits per second. And that's why you can use exactly the same architecture, same network, same Ethernet network that you would use for your Wi-Fi system. That's how Wi-Fi works as well, right? So if you have a Wi-Fi access point, the Wi-Fi access point runs your uh, Wi-Fi physical layer. Your, uh, there's not much of a Mac layer, but uh, the only traffic that goes in Wi-Fi over the Ethernet is user traffic. And we are proposing the same approach for small cells. Yes. 